Hello, everyone. I see we have a nice group of people here. We weren't sure exactly what to expect on a day like today, which is a day like no other. Um, but here you are and here we are. And we're so delighted to have a gentleman whom I suspect many of you know, who I actually haven't seen too often over the years, but whom I met probably around um, the late 1980s or uh, thereabouts, Scott, because our kids were very young, maybe three or four or five, and were going to school together at the Waterfront School in Sag Harbor. Um, right, so that's 30 years ago. Oh my goodness, so, that, so we've, had a long, we've had a long friendship here over the years, and, okay. and here we are. We've sort of been on opposite ends of the East End for a while. But uh, as many of you know, Scott Chasky is a poet, a farmer, and an educator. And for 30 years, he cultivated garlic, greens, potatoes, and 60 other crops for the Peconic Land Trust at Quail Hill Farm in Amagansett, New York, which was one of the original CSAs in the country. A pioneer of the community-supported agriculture movement, he is past president of the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New York and was honored as Farmer of the Year in 2013. He was a founding board member for both the Center for Whole Communities in Vermont and Sylvester Manor Educational Farm in Shelter Island. Uh, Viking published This Common Ground, which was a memoir in 2005, and Seed Time on the History, Husbandry, Politics, and Promise of Seeds was pub published by Rodale in 2014. He's here this evening to talk about his current, he has several, or a couple anyway, oh, he's here to talk about a work in progress, which is titled Soil and Spirit. And we're so happy to have you with us, Scott. So we'll turn it over to you and let's get started. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Penny. Um, when Penny asked me to do this, um, I thought, okay, what, uh, what shall we talk about? And uh, the logical thing is, is what I've been working on uh, for over oh, the last, um, well, since, um, since February or something like that or, or previously. And uh, so that's this book, Soil and Spirit. So just so you know what my intention is, I'm going to um, read from that book. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about things having to do with that book. And... Um, and then uh, hopefully we have time for some, some questions um, because uh, one of the topics uh, will have to do with trees. And um, uh, hopefully we all have questions about, about trees. I know I have many, many more, the more that I learn about them. Anyhow, I'm gonna begin uh, in this most unusual time that we we're in. I was on a Zoom talk earlier in the day and uh, everyone was, looking very sleepy uh, and I was up until three o'clock. I hung in there until then. And so um, anyhow, in this very unusual time we're in, I hope, I hope uh, we're, we're going to, I can, I can lift the spirit some uh, in soil and spirit. So I'm going to start with just this um, uh, something that uh, I, I heard Oren Lyons, who's the faith keeper of the Onondaga nation. Uh, this is how he began one of his talks. I am thankful that you are well. Um, so now to really begin, uh, I'm going to read from uh, the, the last book that I published, which is called Seed Time. And um, it seems like a good place to start because um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking off from that book onto the, the one that I'm writing now. And this is the last paragraph from, uh, from Seed Time. Our culture, our habitation in this time on earth is in need of transformation. Some say in the shape of a new story. Transformation comes from within and seeds have mastered the art. Clover does not think about responsibility its response to altered circumstances is to give nourishment. 
I have sown the seeds of clover and seen it come to flower in the fields, and I have tasted the harvest of nutritious food the following season. May we continue to cultivate our fields with the imperishable mystery in mind and to playfully, carefully follow these seeds and to nurture them where they desire to go. So that's the last paragraph of seed time. And um, now I'm on to the next, the next thing. Um, I don't, I don't know. Uh, hopefully there's, there, there's someone out there. I know my, my brother-in-law who couldn't be on this tonight recognized um, the tongues and trees, books and the running brooks. Um, but he and I have very similar literary tastes, but um, uh, I'm going to read from that uh, just because this is a passage. Uh, I chose this um, sort of arcane title because this one passage spoken by the Duke in As You Like It, Shakespeare's play, uh, has sort of been with me. Um, uh, strangely, uh, it keeps reoccurring in my life. Um, so I'm going to read, read, read from this. Now my co-mates and brothers in exile, Hath not old custom made this life more sweet than that of painted pomp? Are not these woods more free from peril than the envious court? Here feel we not the penalty of Adam, the season's difference as the icy fang and churlish chiding of the winter's wind, which when it bites and blows upon my body, even till I shrink with cold, I smile and say, this is no flattery. These are counselors that feelingly persuade me what I am. Sweet are the uses of advers adversity, which like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. And this, our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues and trees, books in the running brooks, sermons and stones, and good in everything. Well, those last few words are something we need right now and good in everything. So um, that um, maybe one reason that that's resonated in my life for so long is that when I lived in, uh, in Oxford, England, I lived in England for 10 years. I just was taking a little walk down the country lane and a, a fellow, a farmer, local farmer came out and um, we got talking and, and, you know, he learned I, I like to read and write and, uh, and he recited this to me and he said, sweet are the uses of adversity, which like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. And then he stamped his foot and he said, imagine the man thinking of a toad at that moment. Anyhow, that moment, <laughs> that moment has, has stayed with me for 40 years or something like that. So um, tongues and trees, books in the running brooks. Um, so the last book, Seed Time, was obviously very specifically about seeds, about a very particular thing. And um, it, it examined um, as much as I could, as much as I could handle in, in, in that, that frame of a book uh, about the subject of seeds. This is really quite different what I've been working on now um, is really, uh, it's really meant to somehow import uh, something about uh, what, what uh, an environmentalist I know um, has called bioliteracy. And um, it's sort of a, a, a big word, uh, but we all know what it is. And we all know that it's something that we need right now. And maybe the best way into it is um, just to tell stories. So um, that's what I'm doing in this book. I'm, I'm telling some stories from, from travels. So I'm going to read now from, uh, from, from that book. And uh, then one of, one of the things, so when I started this, it actually started with a uh, sort of a meditation on, uh, on a particular tree, on a beech tree uh, that um, I have lived with for uh, 30 years or something like that. So uh, those who don't know me on, on, on this Zoom event, um, I've just uh, 
graduated, as my wife Megan says, um, well, last at the end of last year, from 30 years of farming at uh, Quail Hill Farm for the Peconic Land Trust. And um, the farm shop, uh, which I've spent, I spent 30 years in, uh, has an extraordinary tree, a beech tree, because this is in the beech forest in Amagansett, fairly rare in Long Island, these, these beech forests, uh, some on the North Shore, the middle of the island, and probably the greatest example of it is right there in Amagansett. And there's this great tree which now hugs the building that I spent these 30 years in. And sure, I thought about it and looked at it and put my hand on it for all those years, but I never quite acknowledged it in the way that it, it probably should have been acknowledged and has been now um, in, until I, it was time, time to leave. And um, so I began writing about this beech tree and I discovered that um, beech, uh, if you go back to the Germanic roots, actually means book. Uh, and so there I was, you know, all those years sort of uh, thinking about farming and, you know, arranging crop lists and all that kind of thing, but also writing. So my first book, This Common Ground, uh, about community farming really took place at the end of every day uh, up, up in there under the canopy of this huge beech tree. Um, so um, I've written about it. I'm not reading from that, but um, when the book when the book comes out, um, hopefully many more people can. What I'm going to read from is a chapter um, I've been working on recently, which is called Homeland Stone or Older Than Thought. Known in England, warily by some as the West Country, Valerian by the Romans, Cornwall is a place where the old friendship of stone and man is palpable, visible everywhere. The most visible stone, sometimes labeled as Cyclopean, is granite, and much of the rugged coastline is defined by outcroppings of it and by the caves carved into it by the surging sea. This rock in a molten state welled up in the Carboniferous period and the face of the rock, large crystals of quartz, feldspar, and mica became exposed over centuries. Slates and shales known locally as Killis a product of the earlier Devonian period, add variety to the flow of the land and a volcanic rock, greenstone surfaces along the coast between the bold granite sculptures. The interaction between these various rocks led to the formation of metalliferous ore deposits, copper and tin among them, and thus Cornwall, thousands of years ago, became known as a source of these metals. Whether it is factual or not, Walking above the strong sea on the dramatic coast path, it is fanciful to imagine Phoenician merchants in search of tin guiding their crafts toward the rocky coast of Cornwall over 3,000 years ago. The surrealist painter and writer Ithel Calhoun issued a warning. Unless you like granite, you will not find happiness in Cornwall. That same granite hauled, piled, and artfully placed to build stone walls has long served as a kind of terracing on the steep and uneven terrain so the land could be transformed into meadows to be worked by hardy, adept gardeners with mountain goat pedigree. Throughout the country, throughout the county, the old trackways, often wide enough for only one vehicle, are lined with stone walls some stacked so high as to create a tunnel effect. The surface of these stone hedges, as they're called, is made up of riotous vines and greenery, but the plant life only obscures the careful stone hedging that serves as fencing for the patchwork of farm fields. The prominent standing stones that appear everywhere, menhirs, quotes, quoits, stone circles, in greater concentration than anywhere else in the British Isles, reflect the strong character of the place and add more than a bit of mystery. Calhoun refers to these repositories of ancient power as the living stones. Her book of that title, first published in 1957, begins with an epigram from the Song of Amergen, who was thought to be the first poet of Ireland. Who but I can unfold the secrets of the unhewn dolmen? 
So why am I talking about stone when I brought you in by saying I would talk about trees? Well, I'm gonna to get to the trees. Um, but um, perhaps one reason is that the other part of the title, Soil and Spirit, um, there's a great soil scientist named Hans Jenny, uh, who said that all soil is merely rock descending on its way to the deep. D.H. Lawrence found a place of inspiration on the Penwith Peninsula near Zenner on the Atlantic coast of which he wrote, it is old Celtic, it is not England. It is bare and dark and elemental, Tristan's land. Some recent research has uncovered another layer to add to Lawrence's observation. What is now Cornwall and South Devon as evidenced by Earth's molten mantle was originally part of mainland Europe. In a study published in the journal Nature Communications, a group of geologists from Plymouth University, located on the county border of Cornwall and Devon, conducted, conducted chemical tests on surface magma that welled up from 100 kilometers deep. A clear geological boundary separates the West Country from the rest of the UK, according to Arjun Distra, a lecturer in igneous petrology at Plymouth. Present day Britain was formed from three separate land masses more than 300 million years ago. Originally the northernmost mass, Laurentia, collided with Avalonia. Then over millions of years, Armorica moved up from the south to fuse with Avalonia. The new theory suggests that this second collision or a series of them occurred not beneath the English Channel, but further north, providing the geological foundation of what is now Cornwall. The Plymouth geologists propose this region of the Grand Isle of Britain, located south of Camelford and the X estuary was once part of mainland Europe. A geological historical joke in an area obsessed with Brexit. The roots of these rocks are French to the minutest detail. Stone is visible everywhere in the West Country Trees are not. Though multiple species and some sturdy and noble individuals grow and even flourish in the milder temperatures of Cornwall, especially in the east and southeast, on estates and in protected woodlands, the county can only claim an overall woodland cover of 5%. This is a meager amount, most noticeable in the west, compared with the overall UK woodland cover of nearly 12%, while the figure is much higher in France, in Germany, 30%, and in Italy. As discovered through preserved pollen, it is known that most of the UK was wooded at the end of the last ice age. By the time of the Iron Age, almost all of that cover was gone. Mankind's mischief, which disturbs nature's order, in the words of Alexander von Humboldt, is primarily responsible for deforestation, and in Cornwall, man's mischief was significant. Centuries later, what timber remained was used for house building and shipbuilding. Over the years, massive amounts of wood stoked the fires, part of the smelting process for the production of tin. Historically, in Cornwall, as told to me by my friend Peter Perry, born and raised there, the prevailing attitude has always been, if it grows, cut it down and burn it. Pete, a forestry consultant with a degree in micropaleontology and an artist set out to paint one day at Middle Kemuel in Penwith between Mausel Village and La Morna. Picture that patchwork of farm fields I alluded to, surrounded on all sides by granite walls, Mounts Bay in the English Channel visible to the Southeast, the Atlantic, not far to the north over the moor. Pete said, the place was absolutely howling in a northwesterly near gale with nothing but 3000 miles of ocean between the farm and the Empire State Building. And yet no one, none of the generations of farmers who lived there had ever thought it might be a good idea to fence off a little bit of land and get some trees planted, even if only to break the wind. To the east of the county or up country, as the saying goes, the Forestry Commission has thought to plant some trees in the form of coniferous plantations. True, most of the planted species are imported, 
but conifers grow well and fast in a county warmed by ocean currents and sequestered carbon in the 21st century is the most valuable resource. For those who admire the grace of native trees, these exist in emerald pockets, such as the secluded oak woods of the Helford, Fall, Foy, and Lou estuaries. And robust individual trees are proudly preserved here and there throughout Cornwall. One ancient native tree, the Darley Oak, still survives at Darley Ford on the edge of Bodlin Moor. This Quercus Rober Oak surfaced as a topic of conversation when only a teen in the year 1030. 400 years later, a sympathetic arborist thought to honor the oak by circling it with a stone wall. For a thousand years now, sapwood has carried liquid from roots to leaves and leaves have gathered sunlight to power photosynthesis and chloroplast to feed this noble oak and to produce an excise of 10 million acorns. That's one tree. Though forests are rare in Cornwall, the art of hedging is an honored tradition. And out of the top course of hedging stone, stunted trees sprout and lean at sharp angles, battered by the powerful, persistent winds. The way the white thorn, among others, leans directed by the wind is a revealing signature of an exposed landscape. The most eccentric example of a Cornish forest is Lilliputian in character and classified as a temperate rainforest. And this is at a latitude of 50 degrees north. That's eight degrees further north than we are here. 174 types of lichen, lichen loves moisture, grow in the dizzard dwarf oak forest along the coast of North Cornwall. As you descend the sloping ground toward the sea, the oaks increasingly diminish in height until at the edge of this forest, you stand among 150 year old trees that are less than three feet in height. Should you be searching for a bonsai forest, you will find it at Dizzard. So, so then I go on to, um, I, I, there, there's, there's a series of three sort of um, views into uh, three ways to enter a landscape. And the first one has to do with the coast path that I talked about. Uh, which I used to walk out onto daily, basically, and uh, after I would work in these very steep meadows. And um, uh, for whatever reason, probably because oftentimes this kestrel, uh, the small hawk would fly above, uh, I would recite as I was walking um, uh, The Wind Hover by uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins, a really beautiful poem. Uh, and and uh, so that I'm going to skip over that, but just so you know that that's one of the ways of looking at a landscape. Second way of looking at a landscape, this Cornish landscape, um, focuses on a painter, a wonderful painter named Peter Lanyon, who um, wanted to see it from above. He actually uh, learned um, to paint there in Cornwall and other places in Europe, but he became um, an early abstract expressionist, and and some of his imagery or maybe the key to his imagery came from a glider. So he learned how to fly in a glider and he sees the landscape from above. And then the third I'm gonna read from to finish this, this part of the, of the reading uh, is, is um, from the third way of looking at a landscape is uh, at a beautiful uh, garden uh, at in St. Ives, which is just over the moor from where we lived in, in Mausel, uh, and and it's sort of the artist town. And Barbara Hepworth, the sculptor, uh, moved there uh, early, I think, in the 1939. And uh, I spent some time there in the garden. And so um, this is another way of looking at a landscape. I think you'll you'll get the picture. In a studio garden perched above the St. Ives Harbor, a kind of green oasis contained within tall granite walls above the narrow stone streets, Barbara Hepworth sculpted expressive forums out of stone, wood, and wire. She was inspired equally by landscape and the human figure, the relation of one to the other. 
whether the earthen forums of Cornwall, Italy, Greece, or of her birthplace, Yorkshire. She spoke of the inner beauty of those Northern hills. This is her. Above all, there was the sensation of moving physically over the contours of fullnesses and concavities, through hollows and over peaks, feeling, touching, seeing through mind and hand and eye. The sensation has never left me. I, the sculptor, am the landscape. I am the forum and I am the hollow. When she discovered Penwith, the remarkable pagan landscape, she developed all of her ideas, she said, about the relationship of the human figure in landscape. She came to Cornwall in 1939 and later lived and worked at Trewin, a stone nest above the tightly packed granite cottages that climb up from the sand beach. She praised organic forms, including common things, part of the soil, part of the rhythm of the land. I could write a book about the crystal and the potato, she said. I imagine her in sympathy with the land, with the words of Hugh McDermott, the Scottish poet, who wrote that one who walks the Cornish moors and breaks apart a piece of rock will find it filled through and through with the smell of honey. For a time I worked in St. Ives and at midday I was drawn to Barbara's garden. There within a carefully captivated space and objects carefully carved, the wildness of cliffs and moorland and sea was a strong presence, the living dialogue between art and nature. No sculpture really lives until it goes back to the landscape, the trees, air, and clouds, she said. The names given her work invoke the essence of Penwith. These are the names, ancestral figures, curved form, men here, stringed figure, curlew, sea forms, waves, figure in a landscape. She was inspired by the poetry of Rainier Maria Rilke, who wrote in the Ninth Duino Elegy, here is the time for the sayable, here is its homeland. In her studio, a garden, in her studio garden, a spell is cast by flat stone, curved stone, stone strung with steel water, water falling over rock, branches heavy with leaves, wearing a coat of sea mist. The sculptor heard music in stone, sound woven through granite and the swing of mallet and chisel, the resonance of rain that plucks a steel string. Single notes rise from leaf and stone, steel, glass, wind, my pen and paper. The language of the garden is one movement rough, the next refined, revealed in a work of bronze shaped as an ear or as a mouth. In his poem on a raised beach, Hugh McDermott wrote, the inward gates of a bird are always open. The bird knows not how to close them, and this is the secret of her song. The poet looks at stone in his birthplace and says he knows little of it, but he knows the gates of stone are open too, always open, far longer open, than any birds can be. I am a seedsman descend, descending stone steps with shovel and packets in hand to work the land. I am the walker within the space the wind hover knows by the beat of her heart and wings. I am the traveler who sees the land become the sky, the listener in the garden to the music told lovelier, more dangerous. I am the one who hears in the sweep of air between chisel and stone, the elemental music of a homeland, a language audible and visible. I am feldspar and mica that mirrors the glider's wings. So that's, um, that's from that chapter uh, of the book. I skipped over some, but um, I think you get the, you get the picture. Um, so I did talk about trees after talk, talking about stone. And um, I think what I'd like to do, um, we have some time left, is to um, give you 
um, just a little bit to go on. And I, I've done so much reading um, in, in the last months. Um, interesting um, that I chose this time to, to graduate um, because my intention was to spend a lot of time in my study. Um, and guess what? It's exactly what sheltering has allowed. Um, so I've done a lot of reading and I want to pass on some of this to you um, because uh, the more I get into it, the more and more I'm entranced uh, by all of the lore uh, about trees and the people who love trees. And, um, and, and I, I, I hope that um, more and more people will, um, will also be entranced by it. So um, the first book I want to mention uh, is one I, uh, my, uh, my dear friend and agent, Paul Bresnik is, is, is on here. And he and I have, uh, have communed about um, Richard Powers' great book, The Overstory. Um, it's a novel, but it's filled with fantastic uh, information um, about trees. And, and, uh, and uh, here's a little, here's, here's something that, that comes from Overstory. Join enough living things together through the air and underground, and you wind up with something that has intention. So um, many people are writing about trees now, and um, he, there's a wonderful, wonderful interview with Richard Powers, the author of The Overstory on, on PBS. So you could, you could go on to that and, and, and find it. Any, anybody with any questions after this is welcome to email me too. Um, but, I'll, I'll tell you, if you go on to PBS Canvas Arts, um, uh, Richard Powers talking about books is, is, is really something to see. Also, um, uh, he gives a list of the books that influenced him in writing the overstory, he lists 26 books for those who want to really get into it. Uh, my favorites, because I'm, I, I'm just getting into it now, um, is, a, is a book called The Tree by Colin Tudge, an Englishman. Uh, who says that trees and humans have always had a symbiotic relationship. So that's something that was in my chosen title for this talk as well. There's a wonderful book called The Meaning of Trees uh, by a German fellow who lives in England uh, named Fred uh, Hagenetter. Uh, there's a really wonderful book about one tree, ginkgo. Uh, and I'm sure everybody has some knowledge of ginkgos, but very few people probably know that they've been around for 200 million years. Uh, the only species uh, in that genera as well, ginkgo. It's a wonderful book by Sir Peter Crane. Um, there's a, a, a great book about beech, which I found after I started writing about beech trees. It's called Casting Deep Shade by the poet C.D. Wright. Really wonderful, inventive, creative book. Uh, there's a really hilarious book uh, about mesquite uh, by uh, my friend Gary Paul Naban. Um, really a great book. And um, many people may have read this by now, uh, The Hidden Life of Trees, which actually has, um, has, has made this fellow Peter Wallen been very well known. Um, and he's written some other books since then. But um, he actually refers to uh, a woman named Suzanne Simard, who, uh, who also Richard Powers uses in the overstory as a, uh, a basis for this wonderful character in the overstory. And Suzanne Simard uh, was the one who first came up with this idea of, of, um, uh, of the wood wide web. And, uh, and, and Peter Wallenbin talks about it in, in The Hidden Life of Trees as well. Uh, her book, um, because she's been a scientist who's been studying this um, for decades, uh, she has a book coming out in, in, in May of, uh, of the next year, and it's called Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering How the Forest is Wired for Intelligence and Healing. Um, it's probably going to be a most wonderful book. So that's another one. Um, I have some organizations which I want to recommend as well. And that's, the, that's, that's 
all I'm going to say now. And then hopefully, you know, people will have some questions or we can talk a little bit after that. Um, so the first one I want to mention is uh, the Archangel Ancient Tree Archive. And um, uh, this, this is an amazing organization um, that's located in a little tiny place called Cope. Copamish, Michigan, uh, and the intention is to uh, clone champion trees, uh, and they've been working on this. Uh, David Millarch is the name of the genius in, in, involved in this, who, who came up with this idea, and um, they have, since 2008, they have propagated 300,000 trees cloned from champions. In other words, uh, they've worked a lot with um, uh, with sequoia, and um, they have they have cloned some of the 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 greatest, largest, longest living sequoias, um, which can live for well, are still alive at two thousand five hundred years old. Um, so this is an amazing organization, the Archangel Ancient Tree Archive. Uh, I want to mention another one, which is called the Old Growth Forest Network. Uh, there's a woman named Jean Malouf who's written a number of books. The, the one she's best known for is called The Living Forest. Uh, and now the, the Old Growth Forest Network has like created this network of many, many different people helping to conserve and preserve uh, old growth forests all, all around this country. Um, then I want to mention um, a, uh, an, an, an online organization which is called Emergence which has these really, um, really um, wonderful podcasts. And there's one by Richard Powers, as a matter of fact. So I would recommend you watching that one. There's another great one about W.S. Merwin, who created a sanctuary in Hawaii. He spent um, the whole second part of his long life on, on planting palm trees. And, uh, and, and this, the piece on Merwin is called The Poet and the Palm Tree. Um, so there we are. That's, 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 that's my, that's, that's what I wanted to talk about now. Um, maybe I'll, I'll read one. No, I'll say that to the end. I'll read one poem at the very end, but now if we could, um, you know, Pat or Penny, um, open it up or however you do this so that people can, people can ask some questions or we can talk. Pat, can people mute, unmute themselves or do you, can you unmute them? People are allowed to unmute themselves. And I just ask that if you're not asking a question, just to remain muted so we don't pick up any background noise. Yeah. And if um, anyone would like to ask a question, please feel free, raise your hand, or you can ask a question via chat and we're happy to read it to Scott and have him answer it. I, I don't really have a question. Well, I guess I have a question. I don't know. Are any of these books, Scott, about the way that trees are thought to be able to kind of communicate with each other? Yeah, actually? yeah, yeah. That's what. You, kind of, yeah, that's the that's the sub that's the big subject right now, and yeah. and I think we're gonna get the fullest report on it from Suzanne Samard, whose book is coming out in in May. However. Um, uh, uh, Wallenben's book um, discusses that, and uh, that's the um, what's it called? The, so many of these books. Um, the Hidden Life of Trees. The Hidden Life of Trees. Yeah, and uh, actually, the Meaning of Trees also discusses that as well. It's 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 interesting that you know I know this. I know, I know this is funny that, you know, here I, you know, what, what a, an organic farmer works on and, and, you know, the life work of a, of a farmer is to build up the health of the soil. And, and uh, one of the, one of the um, adages about that is, is, is that the life under the soil uh, is called the undiscovered country. And, uh, and so there's this life going on in the roots of the trees, which is equal to the life above, which we can see. So in this book, I talk about the seen and the unseen as well. And, and it's those connections which are taking place underground uh, in, in the fungus roots, um, the mycelium. Uh, and, and that's what 
Suzanne and other people have been, it's opened up a whole, a whole new uh, field of study uh, uh, for uh, scientists and tree people uh, since the 90s. It, it's so, you know, it's been around for 20 years or something like that, but it's only just starting to be known, I think, now. Um, so there's a, that's one reason for a number of these books about trees. Um, they probably have more to teach us um, by us, you know, choosing to meet with them and walk in the tree. So while I'm recommending books and everything, I think the thing I should have recommended first was to just go out and walk wherever you can among trees, right? I mean, that seems like such a revolutionary concept to us. I mean, we don't think about communication between trees, or at least right. I never had until I read about this. Yeah, yeah, well, it's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Megan, Megan is saying that um, they communicate, you know, in, in, in multiple ways, not only underground, but also, you know, in the air as well. So from, from one tree to another. And um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a phenomenal thing to, to, to see, to learn. Scott, Scott your, your, your book, uh, it's not only about trees, right? It's not only about trees. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I, I I got carried away about trees here, but yeah, there are a number of chapters um, uh, in the book which are taken from my travels, basically. And so, uh, for instance, there's one chapter um, uh, that I wrote after I uh, spent some time in China uh, some years ago at a uh, an international. Uh, Community Support Agriculture Conference, and and then um, some years later, there's another chapter uh, that that um, comes about after after going to another conference in Thessaloniki, Greece. So there is some international international um, uh, information being passed on in this book as well. And um, there's another chapter which uh, has to do with some time that we spent in New Mexico uh, in, 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 uh, it has to do with a wonderful plant, Amaranth, um, and, and meeting some people and, and uh, taking part in a, a ceremony um, having to do with Amaranth. So there's lots of, yeah, there's a bunch of other things going on. The trees keep sort of wanting to get in there. Do you have a timeline of, of expected possible publication of this no we're that paul's working on that okay <laughs> i see I, somebody wrote something in the chat a section pat can you read that uh let's see answering the question it was a question about whether the program will be available to view online and yes it will be we'll oh good be available probably tomorrow that's great Hi, I, I'd like to share something, sorry. Jerome, yeah, I heard when you shared that uh, when you look at the root of the tree, you will find intent. And uh, I love that concept. I, I see trees as cultures of intent, trees. kind of uh, laid out in the world to inspire us. You know, they're kind of like uh, posing with gravity. And, um, and, um, and the way they pause have all the all the language we have in uh, in uh, in dance and expression is exists in the tree, uh, especially in the fall. After the foliage is gone, you see the skeleton left behind, and you can see the ballet dancer expressing itself in all its its ways. And uh, it's beautiful to see the world like this. And we're talking about dwarf forest. I I, I think that the 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 treks we have in Amagendet and uh, and uh, Montauk give access to extraordinary, beautiful, uh, almost like dwarf-like forests as well, which are really yeah. beautiful and filled with extraordinary lichens. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, thank you for that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, oh boy, you know, I, I, I chose to read from, you know, take, taking us all to Cornwall, but of course I could have taken, taken us on a walk um, in Amagansett as well. And, and, Part of the book will do that as well, and uh, and we. This is such a a rich and beautiful and dense and diverse um, uh, place that we live in here. So thank you for for bringing that up. 
Scott. I I um I wonder what in your earlier life led you to be the kind of farmer and poet that you are. <laughs> oh gosh. That's a wonderful question. Uh, my sister Jane is is on is on here and she's known me longer than anybody else. Maybe she has a good <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I grew up in the suburbs, so, um, well, I, I, I can, I, I'll tell you, there, I'm working on a chapter now where um, I, I grew up in the 60s, and, um, uh, you know, there was this back to the land movement that, you know, was made popular by Helen Scott Nearing, well, starting in the 1930s or something like that, and they actually wound up in Maine, and the, the the Good Life Center is located in Maine now, on the coast of Maine. I found my way to the coast of Maine, and 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 a world opened up. Actually, um, a world of, of of trees and water. We lived right on the Saco River, and I was helping some friends redo an old farmhouse. And um, you know, maybe. I, I don't know how that how that happens or how one is led to you know discover what is in there and what is part of part of one's life. That's that's part of the hidden, um, unseen uh, nature of things that um, I, I I don't have a good explanation for. But I found it there, and then we um, uh, we uh, m moved to to England and and. Um, lived on a coast in an extraordinary place that I just read about, the Penwith Peninsula. And um, I wound up working in these cliff meadows and that led to um, just having, having to be involved with soil, with working with soil in some way. Uh, and then came back here and um, again, uh, this thing called community supported agriculture was just beginning. No one had ever heard of it. And uh, that gave uh, a way to um, work with soil and with plants and to be out in the open and to also discover something and learn from what building community was about. So, oh boy, I, it's, I don't think I've answered the question. <laughs> I think you have. <laughs> okay, thank you. Let's see, do we have more questions here, Pat? Uh, someone commented that Chadmore and Montauk like the English Moors. Oh, uh, hmm. you know, you, th there's probably some truth in that and you could probably locate, um, you could probably locate, a, the moor, Moors vary, you know, they're, uh, not every Moor is the same as the, another Moor, and so um, the one the ones that I was talking about in Cornwall are really quite different, but my guess is, yeah, if you went further up country, as they say, you probably would find something that was quite similar to that. I just wanted to say and comment, I just started reading the um, Ova story and I found it so fascinating the way it takes you on a progression from tree to tree mm. and the personnel, the family involved mm. in, in these trees. Mm. I thought it was a remarkable way of, of presenting that. Mm. Yeah, thank you for saying that. It, it's an extraordinary book. He's a brilliant writer and, um, and, and I like what, you know, someone said about it that, that, that what, that the trees are first in that book. And that's what, yes. that's what he says too, actually. And you know, it is an interesting thing when he talks, that's why I encourage you to go to this PBS thing and listen to him, is that he actually left his, his teaching job in, at Stanford and, uh, and he moved to um, a old growth forest in North Carolina. And that's where he lives now because he was, he, 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 he was so influenced by what he learned about trees uh, that he actually changed his life and, and moved and lives in an old growth forest. Thank you. I, yeah. I just wanted to comment that, um, and thank thank you. You know, I, I, I woke up this morning with a, with a sense of dread because I, I didn't watch anything last night because I chickened out. So I, uh, you know, I don't want to change the subject, but in, in contrast, 
the beauty of your, your words and the consideration of trees and nature, it, it's, it's, was very healing. And I think in the future days, a really good counterpoint to the other kinds of noises that uh, invade our ambience. So thanks, thanks a lot. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I hope yeah. so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah interesting. We didn't, I don't think when Penny asked me to do this, we had any, it wasn't on our mind at all with, with the election day, but just was arranging the, arranging for this day. So um, okay. thank you. And I woke up thinking, oh, why did I ever, ever think that we should do this today? And now I am also very grateful, Scott, that this couldn't have been a, a more wonderful sort of respite and you know we are very lucky that you have been a human being so open to nature and so able to express your uh, love of the natural world in the ways that you have so you know I'm I'm sure we're all very grateful that we came here tonight at least I am and I hope others are too thank you Penny yeah I do, I, I do, I, before we say the final thank you and have your poem, I do also want to mention speaking because the subject of the election came up that I, I do want to mention that next Tuesday, we, I, some of you are, I'm sure, interested in, in, in the state of our nation. And we, we have a program next Tuesday at five uh, with a professor, uh, Julian Zelliger, who wrote a book called uh, Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker and the Rise of the Republican Party. I had to announce that. It's actually the last program that I will be at mm. for the library. So anyway, forgive me for doing that, but I'm hoping that some of you may want to come. So now we'll get back into your poem. You will read for us before we end. Would you, Scott? Yeah, I'll read one, one poem. Um, and this is a poem that I wrote. Um, I've been working on a chapter about that time. I never imagined that I, I would, I would um, write about it in, in, in the way that I'm doing now, but it's fitting into this book. And this is, this is um, something that I wrote in my, uh, in my late 20s, uh, living in Southern Maine along the Saco River. He slows at the oak tier yards to the river. Near a beach wave's leaf left of winter's chafe, sand bed pocket stone constant of flood led into thicket. Silken marks the young leaf, dry weeds crest in her hair, though he sees wet roots on her bed. He picks the pulp of apple root, sweats in sun, brushes shad, broods for lack of oar, shade and flood, sun for her bed. Turn the root pulp red. So that's just an ode, a song. Um, thank you all for being here. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. We can unmute and clap, and we can do that because this was a wonderful program, Scott. And I'm so glad that you did it. Particularly, it was sort of a last minute request, and you did it. And we're so glad you did, and we're very happy to have so many of you here. And we do have a nice comment from Mariana Canios. Praise the nature writers and Scott for broadening the context of creation we live in, awaking our spirits. Oh, thank you, Marianne. And I'm thank assuming you, Scott. Thank you. that your books are available at Canios, are they? they should be. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> okay, good. But all praise to Scott. It was a lovely trans transformative uh, evening. I had to duck out for a little bit of time, but thanks for your wonderful words. I think we can all echo that, Marianne. Thank you. So we'll call it a day here. And Scott, we hope to, we'll keep track of you and you must let us know when that book is um, out in the world. Okay. Um, and so we'll do that. We're really happy. I wanted to make one last comment. I know you hinted at the primordial intelligence of the rock, and uh, I don't know if you've ever been exposed to the sweat lodge ceremony of the Shinnecock Indian, but they do take the rocks from Montauk and they make them burn into the fire for the whole day. And then they sweat with them. 
thinking that they exchange with them this primordial intelligence that they contain before language was formed, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I have. <laughs> I have actually taken part in that. Thank you. Yeah, and, yeah, extraordinary. <laughs> okay, I think that's it for all of us. Thank you again for giving us this wonderful hour, Scott. And thanks to all of you for, for being here with us. Yeah, thank you all. And uh, thank you all okay. for being good listeners. Trees are good listeners too. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Take care. Onward.